Okay, uh, in behavior modification per se, it's mostly the chamber data, okay? And the most extensive research that has been done was done on smoking cessation, and most of it was done in my labs in various places. And what we basically did was take, the, first, the very first study was basically an attitude change study. And I had done attitude change studies before that, but I wanted to see what would happen if you attacked an attitude that was a real, in t real in terms of affecting behavior outside and ex the experimental situation. And so we recruited smokers, and we did not say that it was a study on smoking cessation. We just told them a study on, on sensory deprivation. That was back in those days. Um, and we asked them to indicate how many cigarettes they smoked on average. That, and that was buried in a whole bunch of other questions like, you know, how many miles do you drive a day uh, to get to work and that kind of thing. So they didn't know that it was about smoking. And then we had um, a group that was in the chamber for 24 hours and occasionally heard a message about smoking. This was about the time that the Surgeon General's report came out the first really scientific evidence that smoking had a health, negative health effects on people. So we asked them about, you know, do they believe that smoking could lead to lung cancer and that sort of thing. Um, and then we had another group that had only the 24 hours of darkness and silence, no messages at all, and we had a control group that was outside. And <clears throat> then we followed up uh, not only their attitudes, but also their behavior. How many cigarettes were they smoking after, after the study? And we did, I think, a, a one week follow-up, a month follow-up, and a year follow-up. And what we found, much to our surprise, I was not expecting it, uh, much to our surprise, they had reduced their smoking rate significantly, whether they heard the messages or not, which was quite interesting. So. You know, I'm always skeptical about this thing, these things, and I, and I thought, you know, smoking is a really ingrained habit, and if you're a smoker who smokes 20 cigarettes or more per day, you're not going to change that just because you went into the dark room for 24 hours and, and did or did not hear some messages. So we followed up. And the next study we did, um, we followed up for two years, and we, we rec that time we recruited smokers um, who had wanted to quit and were never able to. Okay, so these were kind of hard cases, right? And we followed them up, and we found that two years later, they were still smoking less, and a fair number of them had quit completely. Uh, some of them who, had, who were smoking again were smoking less than before, but they said that they had quit completely for some period of time after they came out, but then something very stressful happened, and they started smoking again, because they used smoking to, to deal with stress but they felt that as soon as the stressful period was over, they could quit again, which they were never able to do before. Well, whether that was accurate or not, we don't know. But a two-year follow-up showing a reduction is pretty impressive. The problem with smoking cessation, the problem with most behavior change attempts is relapse. Uh, there are lots of techniques that can get you to stop smoking. The problem is that within six months to a year, that effect disappears, almost no matter what treatment you use. And, you know, Mark Twain once said that the easiest thing in the world is to quit smoking. He had done it a thousand times. So that, that, that's, you know, that's accurate. That's the way it is. So then what we did was we combined smoking, in, smoking aspects of, of uh, the chamber with a behavioral modification method that had a good effect outside. It was a, a tested clinical uh, approach to smoking cessation. And what we did was we had people go through this system. We had a clinical psychologist, um, Alan Best, who was interested in smoking cessation and had done a fair number of studies with it and also treated people. So we had him do his technique, behavior modification, and then we put people in the chamber for 24 hours and played them some of these messages, although you know, the messages we never found made, made a real difference, but it was, it was a rational, rationalizing of why we put them in there. And once again on the follow-up, um, it was really interesting. The people who, were, who went through the cognitive behavioral modification technique with Alan had a, had a quit rate and a smoking reduction rate, which was about the same as the people who had rest 
without the cognitive behavioral modification. So the two were equivalent in, in their power. But the people who had both quit at twice the rate of either one. So the, the, the effects of the two things summated. Okay, so, so the combination of the two was equal to the independent effects of either of those. Which was very, very interesting and very powerful uh, technique in those days. Furthermore, the relapse rate dropped tremendously. So I think, I, I can't remember now exactly what the relapse rate was, but it was, it was like half of what you'd get with, uh, with the best of the other uh, smoking cessation interventions. So that was very promising. Then we did a number of parametric studies to see whether staying in the chamber for less time would have the same effect, and it didn't, 20, uh, and also longer time. We had, I think we had six, 12, 24, and 48 hours, and 24 was the best. So, you know, what we prescribed was if you want to help people quit smoking, uh, that's what you do. You do a, a, a good clinical uh, treatment plus 24 hours of, of uh, the chamber. And then we also tried it with some clinical methods that didn't work, that we knew were not very effective. And the rest effect was still there, but the summation wasn't. Um, then we tried it in the tank, had no effect at all. Some other people also tried the tank and had no effect at all. So, you know, we're still stuck with 24 hours of chamber rest as being the smoking cessation technique of choice. Uh, then um, a psychologist at St. Elizabeth Hospital in Washington uh, did a study with people who were on the verge of being clinical alcoholics. So they drank way too much, but they weren't completely ad addicted yet. You know, it takes, it goes by steps. And they stopped, they stopped drinking, uh, or, they, or they reduced their drinking tremendously. Uh, Rod Borey did a study on weight reduction, found very good effects. People lost weight when they, after they came out. He did, I think, a six-month follow-up, and they were still losing weight. Control group was not. Um, I did one study. I was in Australia for a few months. I did a study on uh, getting people to take into the chamber uh, that we, we had them identify the food that gave them the most problem in terms of weight reduction that they couldn't resist. They loved it so much, uh, and, but they knew that it added to their weight. So we had them take that in with the chamber with them, and that's all they got to eat for 24 hours. They came out and they said, I'm never going to eat that stuff again. And, uh, you know, I didn't have time to follow that up, but, but it had that effect of satiating uh, that taste. They got, they got sick of that taste. Um, so there were, there were a number of other studies. Rod did follow-ups on, on his weight reduction. Uh, he did one study with, with severely obese patients, found a very good effects on, on weight loss with them. So um, my conclusion on that is that, and, and people doing this with the tank typically did not have such good results. Um, so my conclusion was that in order to deal with problems that are controlled by the central nervous system that have to do with voluntary behavior um, the chamber is more effective than the tank. There are other things that the tank is more effective on, those things that have to do with the autonomic nervous system, um, tension, muscle tension, um, insomnia, that kind of thing. Uh, for that, the, the tank is much more effective than the chamber. So they both have their own um, idiosyncratic uh, uses. Uh, 